All right. So for this afternoon session, we're going to have a series of case studies and discussions. And the first one we have is from Stephen Nowakowski. So Stephen is a cartographer, author, and photographer for Rainforest Reserves Australia. And will describe for us firsthand experiences with environmental assessments, approvals, processes, construction, and operation of wind farms in Queensland. So, Stephen, I'm really excited to hear about your perspectives. Yes, yeah, so thank you, the Australian Nuclear Association and uh, UNSW for hosting the event. Um, I'm just going to pour some water on some water here. <clears throat> yeah, so I can't believe I'm here actually because three years ago I had no interest in energy whatsoever. And I was one of those people that marched the streets for climate action and I still believe that we need climate action. And I was marching the streets for climate action being completely naive of how to achieve that. And what are the, what's the, the physicality and the constraints in, in, in our energy system to try to achieve that? And this is really my energy journey. Um, let's see. So I'm a, I'm a photographer and I take photos and I make a living out of scenic, um, beautiful images. Um, and I saw calendars around Australia um, showcasing Australia's wild places in our wonderful natural environments. And I live in North Queensland. And we were actually, we had the first wind farm in Australia, basically, 25 years ago, called the Windy Hill Wind Farm. And that's been going now for 25 years, um, but two turbines have already burnt down since then, but they're on their last legs. And then back in 2017, uh, we were host to Australia's, yeah, Australia's, was it, no, it's not, I'm sorry, Queensland's, first industrial wind farm, so big, big turbines. And we want climate action. So we embrace, so the conservation sector in North Queensland embraced this wind farm because of its, um, uh, you know, reduction in emissions and so forth. So, and I was engaged by the proponent and the proponents is uh, it's a company called Ratch. It's a Thai based company and the major shareholders are the Thai royal family. So I was engaged by Ratch to photograph the construction of this particular wind farm. And what we're looking at here is one of the blades. And this is 57, 57 metres long. It's 12 tonne. And the reason why I'm showing it is to show the scale and the manoeuvrability of how to get these, these big components need to get to, to, get to the site. Um, so um, corners are cut. Uh, power lines are lifted in some cases, like in the recent uh, Caban wind farm, all the power lines had to be lifted to get the big components in. So that gives you an idea of scale. Now this is 57 metres long. The new generation of turbines that are being earmarked at the moment for central Queensland, those blades are up around 89 metres to 100 metres long, so twice this length. So now you can sort of understand why um, it's quite challenging to get these components onto site. Um, yeah, so twice the length of these. This wind farm was going into a place called Mount Emerald, and it's a beautiful plateau just west of Coranda, west of Cairns, where I live. Uh, it's, it was untouched, okay? No cattle grazing, nothing. One of the best uh, populations of quolls in, a, in North Queensland. Beautiful wildflower country and five really rare and endangered plant species. But back at the time, that was okay. You know, that's, this is the price we need to pay for renewable. I was happy to sacrifice endangered plants and quolls because the proponents were saying this wind farm was going to deliver enough power for 70,000 homes. And I thought, well, that's great because I can live in my home, connect, you know, being connected to the mains power, put my toaster on in the morning, and I could do that um, carbon neutrally. So that was a price to pay, and we were all happy with that. And that's what the country looked like. So really beautiful country. And that's what it's like today. So it's a network of roads, um, substations, transmission lines, 
Um, so it's all been carved up. Oh, go back. <laughs> yeah. So that was my partner at the time, um, yeah, Sally. And that's my mate Ing in the, in the, in the yellow backpack. He's a botanist. So we used to walk up there quite often and look for these endangered plants and, and uh, have, a, have a great time up there. So to give you an idea of scale, I don't know where the laser is, there it is. That's a bus. So that's a school bus there to give you a sense of scale. Um, I can't remember the actual length of these, the height of these. Um, they're 57 metre blades. But uh, the new generation turbines, like I said, are a lot higher. So the ones down in central Queensland, which I'll touch on later, they're hitting, uh, they're around 250, 260 metres high, up to, uh, basically up to 290 metres high for the upper Burdekin wind farm to the tip of the blade. Um, to see if this plays. Oh, there's no volume. There should be volume there. Oh. Yeah, so basically blasting out ridge lines. Um, it's, it's easier to blast out the rock than use rock breaking machinery. Um, oh, that, that one there didn't finish. Um, yeah, so we, I documented the Mount Emerald wind farm and I thought, well, that's, you know, we're now carbon neutral, 70,000 homes, that's great. There'll be no more wind farms for North Queensland. And then um, about a couple of years later, that was 2017, a few years later, I heard of this Caban wind farm. And I know that the wind farms are so brutal on the landscape. I thought, geez. So I sort of closed my eyes to this. I didn't want to know about it. And then I had a friend in a government department set, called me up and said, look, the dozers are there. Um, go in and get some shots because, you know, we need to see what's going on. So I went out to the site, got the drone up in the sky and the clearing had already started. And again, it's high elevation forests. So in Queensland, we don't really have any wind per se down the east coast. We're not a windy state. We're not blessed with the wind resources of South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania and, and you know, many areas of New South Wales. We do have wind in Queensland but it's out west. It's out west. So Hewenden, Forsyth, great wind, but nothing up the coast. However, there is wind up on the high ridges, the high elevation areas. And that's what the wind farm industry is targeting, is those high areas. So I went there repeatedly and documented the destruction of forests. And it was heartbreaking. And I've actually worked for the Australian Conservation Foundation, WWF, Friends of the Earth, or not Friends of the Earth, but um, Greenpeace, photographing this very thing. And it's those organisations that don't want to know about this very thing. Um, so clearing land for the turbine pads at Caban. Um, in, you know, initially clearing off the knolls of vegetation and then blasting out those knolls. Again, this is a video. Um, that previous photo was just the knoll over to the left. There's no sediment control, no erosion control. So the wind farm industry is basically exempt from the legislation that we have fought hard for over the years, such as the Vegetation Management Act, the Nature Conservation Act, uh, the reef regulations. So no sediment control, no erosion control. Um, this industry is basically exempt. Um, by, and what they use is the state code 23 for wind farms at state level. And it's really just a fast track process, a one stop shop. And the only mechanism to stop these inappropriate projects is through the EPBC Act. Um, and that's only if there's a threatened or endangered or vulnerable species on the site. Otherwise, they go straight through. And we're seeing in Queensland projects that, that are going straight through, like Bungaban Wind Farm. I only found out about that two weeks ago uh, by chance. And then last week, it went straight through to Plebiscet. So we had no idea that project was in the pipeline. Um, and it's not necessarily just the clearing of the land or the forests, it's the fragmentation that's the issue. So it's the fragmentation of forests and it's punching roads into remnant forests. So all these areas that are being targeted are remnant. These are areas that have been in the past either too steep or too rugged or too wild to industrialise, to urbanise or to put in high value agriculture. So it's now these areas that are being fragmented. And when you fragment forests, um, 
we have things called edge effects where forests, a forest change 200 metres either side of a road. So there's more light coming into the forest. There's weed incursions and, and altered fire regimes. So these, these forests change. And that science is, is very clear. Yeah, so you can see, you know, the roads are quite wide because of the sweep of those blades. So these blades for this one, I think they're 87 metres long. And on the truck, those blades need to turn around up the road and they need to widen, have really wide roads for the sweep of those blades. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of cut and fill. Um, this is the Caban site. This is a video as well. Yeah, so the residents of this area were really in the dark. They didn't know that this was being built on their doorstep. And there's a lot of angst in the community. We've had a number of families now move away. Their local hairdresser in Ravenshoe, there's no hairdresser anymore. They've moved away. Um, they can't deal with um, uh, the visual nature of it, the noise, and the infrasound is a very big issue. And uh, of, I know families there that are now trapped. They can't sell their homes. They're, they've got the infrasound and they're really, they're really struggling. The other aspect is the lights at night. So what used to be just a dark sky where you could see stars at night is now uh, all the red lights illuminate the sky. So now it's an industrial landscape. Um, so, you know, people who used to lie in their beds at night and see the stars, it's all just a red haze. Um, and, and these landowners were never told about that. So these are aviation lights for aircraft. So it made me think, okay, so I documented Caban. I thought, well, surely that's enough. You know, how many more wind farms can there be? And my background is cartography and I love maps. So I started searching the internet. And these are really cryptic projects to find. You can't find these projects in a day. It, this is three years of work, constantly going onto websites, trying to find projects in the pipeline, whether it, going, whether it be going to the EPBC Act, state approval process. So just in my area in North Queensland, these are the projects in the pipeline. So the first two, the green ones, they're actually commissioned, they're operational. All these others are in the pipeline. Okay, now if all these were to be developed, there would be 13 and a half thousand hectares of classified remnant forest. This is forest that's never been touched, will be cleared. Um, what I want to do, I've only got half an hour, so I'm going to talk about these last two, these two here in yellow. So we hear a lot about the Kidston pumped hydro, and pe you know, politicians say, oh, you know, it's a great pumped hydro, there's no uh, impact on biodiversity. And on the face of it, it looks really good. You know, so we've got solar panels on the tailings dam, the two disused uh, pits, mining pits, pump water, great, really good. But no one talks about stage two, which is 1,400 hectares of Fermida woodland to be cleared to make it all viable. You know, so forests like this. <laughs> I've got to laugh because it's so delusional. Um, yeah, so now there's another one in the pipeline called the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm and just, um, just south of uh, where I live. Um, this is just massive and this is epic. Um, so what we've got here is I'm sitting on top of the uh, Mount, uh, Mount Fox volcanic crater. This is Tommy Gertz, traditional owner. Basically, all this country here will be the Mount Fox Energy Park, 55 turbines. All this country here will be, I can't remember the exact number now, uh, I think 80-something turbines. That's uh, Wind Labs, Twiggy Forest. Um, and then down to the, the other side, over the other side, will be Karma Wind Farm, another 50 or 60 turbines. So about two to 300 turbines in this area. And this particular site is amazing in terms of biodiversity. Shamans, rock wallabies, red goshawks, the holy grail of raptors in Australia, the, the red goshawk, uh, the best population of koalas in North Queensland. 
um, Rufus Bedongs, Wedged Hull Eagles, the entire gamut of a functioning ecosystem is in this country. And there's about 200 turbines or so earmarked for this area. Complete. And this, so this project is sitting with Plebisec right now and she's due to make a decision any day. And she'll, she'll approve it. So she'll approve it with dodgy offsets. And I'll talk about offsets later. There's Aboriginal rock art right next to the project location, but then the Gugu Baden signed off an Indigenous land use agreement without even doing a cultural heritage survey before signing off. So with this particular project, I then um, digitised in the footprint of the project and those yellow lines are the haulage roads. To give you an idea of scale, I then overlaid the haulage roads over the city of Cairns. So this, this project would extend all the way, for those who know North Queensland, from Palm Cove right down to Yarrabah. So about 150 kilometres of haulage roads. Um, yeah, so the site's full of uh, these rock boulders where the shaman's rock wallabies are and they'll be blasted out. Where the wind farm is, is um, proposed is here. That was actually earmarked as being um, the next in line for national park acquisition due to its high biodiversity. So national parks have slowly been acquiring the land from the north. So up the north is Oak Hills, Waruna, sorry, um, Princess Hills, Waruna, Oak Hills. That's actually part of Oak Hills as well. That's national park as well. So that was earmarked for national park, but Twiggy got it first. Now it's gonna be wind turbines. So it made me wonder, well, what's, where's the end game? This is just North Queensland. Um, why, why, is it, why are these projects going to such high biodiverse areas? So then I looked at all the transmission infrastructure. So the red lines are the transmission lines. And what we can see here is um, uh, uh, Mount Emerald Wind Farm, Caban, Desailly Solar Park to the north, that's on the Cooktown line, which I haven't got mapped there. Shalumban, I won't talk about that, but we had a recent win with that one. Upper Burdekin, Mount Fox, and then just to the south, we know of two more wind farms in here, Karma and Hidden Valley. So what we're seeing here are these wind farms hugging the transmission lines. It's all about access to transmission lines, nothing else. It doesn't matter what the, eco, what the biodiversity is, it doesn't matter. It's all about access to transmission because that's cheap. And unfortunately, the transmission line is either on top of the Great Dividing Range, like in North Queensland, or just to the west of the Great Dividing Range in Central Queensland, and they can tap into that and then get to the top of the, the high mountains to the east. So what the conservation sector is really wants, you know, so the conservation sector says, well, we can achieve net zero. And you have to remember, net zero just isn't electricity generation, but it's the decarbonisation of our agricultural sector and also our, tra and our transport fleet. So to do that, this is what the conservation sector is saying, we can, this is how we achieve it. So this is from the Net Zero report. And basically by covering six times the spatial footprint of Tasmania with solar panels, with steel and glass, we can actually achieve that. And that's gonna cost 1.5 trillion by 2032 or six to seven and six to seven, or sorry, seven to nine trillion dollars by 2060. And this plan is endorsed by the Australian Conservation Foundation, the Climate Council. And I'm thinking it's either I'm absolutely delusion, I'm delusional or they're delusional. I don't know. <laughs> you know, some people would look at this and go, well, this is, this is what we need to do. And they'll think upon this as being, this is, this is achievable. And I've got no degrees whatsoever, only an associate diploma in mapping. I've got no energy degrees, nothing. And I'll look at that and I'm just a lay person and I can see the delusion in this. I can see the delusion in Sun Cable. I can see the delusion in a lot of these big grand projects. It's, it's a complete rubbish. Yet, these, the, but you got these organizations that stand behind this and actually endorse it. So the conservation sector, who I used to be a very proud member of for 30 years as an activist, they're living in la-la land. And what's actually happening in Queensland is this. And this is three years of work, trying to keep abreast of all the projects in the pipeline. 
And there's actually more than that. There's about 113 projects right now. And this is what's happening in reality. It's not what the Climate Council is saying is supposed to be happening. So what we have here is a map of Queensland. And you can see the red, all the red lines. That's the, where the projects are planned. Those um, yellow, orange polygons are projects where I know there's going to be wind farms, but I don't know where the haulage roads and turbines are going. And if we just zoom in to this little area here between Gladstone and Rockhampton, oh. all those red lines are the um, wind farms. So you can see that they're really, they really want to get into those high elevation areas um, and, and hard up against state forests and national parks. So if we look a little bit closer into that geographic area, you can see the black lines, they're the transmission lines, high voltage. So that's the Clark Creek wind farm, um, Twiggy Forest, he's got bulldozers in there right now. That was approved under the previous federal government um, by Susan Lay. And then the Albanese government was elected. And this is what's happened in the last 12 months. Yeah, so these are wind farms and so on. This is catching up. Yeah, so that's, this, that's the current state of play between Rockhampton and Gladstone with wind farms. To give you an idea of scale, that's the upper Calliope Solar, proposed solar park. That's 2,700 hectares. I've photographed, I've photographed um, for 500 hectares I can't imagine 2,700 hectares. Well, I can, I've, I've flown over it in a helicopter. It's, but it, it's massive, you know. Um, and, that's gonna, and, and, and that's gonna be used as an offset for Rio, basically, for their smelter in Gladstone. So vast amounts of country is gonna be occupied by wind and solar. Now, if we dig down into some of these projects, and we look at the actual spatial footprint of these projects on the ground. This is Clark Creek. So I just mentioned that there's bulldozers in there right now. So if we do an overlay of the haulage roads and then on the right hand side, we've got the vegetation type. So the green is classified remnant. It's forest that's never been cleared. Okay, so it's been there to its old growth forest. The yellow areas are of concern. And we can see haulage roads actually going into the of concern forest up here. You know, if, if a, a grazier or farmer went into clear of concern forests, they'd be in jail, they'd get prosecuted. But these guys are exempt, they can just go straight through. Um, I've been there a number of times, I've camped on the property and whatever, um, amazing biodiversity. Um, but as you can see, the punching haulage roads, oh, go back. Yeah, haulage roads. So this here, they've pushed this road around so they can actually get the trucks around with the big sweep area for the blades and there'll be a turbine going in here. So no sediment control, no erosion control. Um, quite a few concrete batching plants on the site because they need to make concrete on the site for the slabs, um, for the foundations. Um, again, no sediment control, no erosion control. We've got no idea what the impact on amphibians is going to be downstream. They're exempt from the RIF regulations. So if you're a farmer in this neck of the woods, you need to put in sediment control, fill out paperwork, you know, to show how you're gonna mitigate against runoff into the Great Barrier Reef. These guys don't need to do it. Huge amounts of concrete and cement. Um, I think these are around 500, 600 cubic meters of reinforced concrete going into each one. They last 20, 25 years. They can't be reused because of the stress on those foundations, when they get decommissioned, they need to put in a new foundation for the next generation of turbine, if that ever happens. Um, but I'm very skeptical about how they're gonna be decommissioned. I don't know if anyone really knows how they're decommissioned. No one's actually explained to me how they're decommissioned. I don't know. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, they're not, yeah. Yep. So I've been told by an industry insider that most likely they'll have an oxy torch torch around the bottom and just drop them down like trees. 
Uh, cl uh, this is the Lotus Creek. I flew over this just recently in a helicopter. There's bulldozers in here right now clearing for this one. This is, this is a criminal, criminal act. It should not be happening. This is, oh, okay. Um, I'll just do a quick, I've only got five minutes, so I'll quick. All these uh, mountains here are being bulldozed right now. I did an overlay, haulage roads. That's, that's all going to be haulage roads and blown away. Um, I'll just go through these quickly. Um, yep, turbines on top of this cliff line. That's going to get blasted out, turbine here at Moa Creek. Just want to go through this real quick. I'll click, do that. So with those projects I just showed you, there's 50, I think there's about 53 wind farms in the pipeline. That will generate 22 gigawatt of nameplate capacity. Because of the low capacity factor, 15-35% uh, generate 5 gig. We peaked at 13 gig last summer in Queensland. The state government actually intervened and turned people's smart meters off and shut down people's homes to conserve power. Um, you know, so we're gonna, we're gonna need double that. So about 110, 115 wind farms in Queensland just to keep the lights on in summer. Um, unless, unless we have a whole network of pumped hydros by then. Um, just gonna go through quickly. So we, uh, we just engaged a botanist, Jeanette Kemp. Uh, she's the former Queensland government principal botanist. We gave her all our mapping and she's identified that if all these projects go ahead, we'll clear about 29,000 hectares of classified remnant forests. But with the edge effects, so the forests that will be altered either side of the roads, we're looking at about 114,000 hectares of classified remnant to be impacted upon. Around 4,100 kilometres of brand new roads to be pushed into these wild remote areas. Um, for example, the Mount Fox Energy Park, uh, though the, the, the Mount Fox Energy Park, that's the yellow roads, that's the haulage roads. The orange, ro orange lines are the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm. We're looking at those roads going in through some really endangered ecosystems. Um, I'll just go through this quickly. These are all the plant species that will be impacted upon that are either endangered, endangered and vulnerable or near threatened. So you're the first people to see this data. We've just come up, we've just had this botanist do the work. Um, seven North Queensland species that will probably become endangered if these wind farms proceed. Um, we've got three plant species um, that may be impacted because of their uh, genet genetic significance. Um, so this, the State Energy and Jobs Plan says that we need 600,000 hectares of land. That's published black and white in their job plan. But because our renewable energy is only 15, 30% capacity factor, we're gonna need about 1.8 million hectares. If we go all electric vehicle uh, transport, basically double that. Redundancy, hydrogen, Superpower, it's delusion. Now, why do we need so many wind farms? So those first few slides I showed you of Mount Emerald, that's been operational now for a while. I looked at the data, pulled the data out of the NEM, it's all publicly available, and graphed it. So this is the generation of that particular wind farm installation. That was a $400 million piece of kit. Um, for 63 days cumulatively, it generated zero electricity. For 107 days, it generated less than 10 megawatt. It's completely meaningless electricity. That's why we need so many wind farms, so then it becomes meaningful. And this, <laughs> so you need to overbuild all this stuff to get meaningful electricity. And then you need, need to string it together with transmission substations and everything else and back it up and firm it. And then you need gas to back it all up when it fails. <coughs> So then I looked at Ratch, the actual company that built that first wind farm. And in 2021, 2022, they made $161 million. They do have a couple of wind farms down in South Australia. They paid zero tax. They're now one of the top 100 companies in Australia that pay no tax. Um, so we've counted about 3,365 turbines are in the pipeline for Queensland. The number's more than that, it's over 4,000, because we don't know how many turbines are going into the Prosser Pine Wind Farm, the Karma Wind Farm, Hidden Valley Wind Farm, and uh, the Yungala Wind Farm, so well over 4,000 turbines. And no one knows about this. 
Um, hydrogen blows my brain. Um, this is a proposal for the Murchison, Murchison hydrogen footprint. Um, that's uh, 10,000 hectares of solar, 700 turbines over 50,000 hectares, and then they need to dredge out a deep water port to export it. Um, and I don't really know how all this will work when the wind blows, the sun shines, how they back it up. I've got no idea. It's, I'm not an energy expert, but just looking at it at face value, it looks a bit pie in the sky. Um, so basically all this background here will be turbines if that was to proceed. Um, and then you've got the Gladstone Port Authority. So I had a friend go to a Gladstone Port Authority event just late last year and they're talking about hydrogen being a major player in Gladstone, Gladstone being a, a hub for, for hydrogen production, and they're openly advocating that we need 10,000 oh, 10, turbines around Gladstone to ramp up hydrogen. There's no wind around Gladstone. If there is any wind, it's on top of the ridge lines that are being blasted out right now. So. <laughs> Um, so we need 2,500 square kilometres of solar. Um, so at the conference, they're saying we need 4,000 new transmission towers just for hydrogen at Gladstone. We need 17 times the steel equivalent of the Story Bridge to facilitate that just for hydrogen. Makes, makes nuclear a no-brainer. <laughs> uh, I won't talk about pumped hydro because that's another, to me, a delusion. Um, so my thoughts are, should we be clearing and fragmenting forests for renewables? Are we going down the wrong path? Where is our model for 100% renewables and which countries are carbon free? And it is a climate emergency and we need to get off coal and gas. And I do believe in renewables, but what are the solutions? And I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but this has not been my personal energy journey. and. The solutions to me are good renewables. So rooftop solar, I've got rooftop solar, small community grids, locally owned wind farms, in, and industrial wind farms if there's community consent in low biodiversity, low cultural significant areas, um, degraded land or nuclear, and, and, and nuclear. Yeah, so. <clears throat> yeah, so nuclear must be part of our solution. Um, and then when I've read more about nuclear, I was very anti-nuclear. And then, but when I saw the, the impact of renewables, I had to put my ideology aside and revisit nuclear, talk to experts, read books, and learn about the technology. And that, that's what I've done. And I now believe nuclear is part of that solution. And James Hansen, who first warned of climate change to the US Senate back in the 80s, he's a large, you know, really big advocate for nuclear. The Dalai Lama understands the way we lift developing nations out of poverty is with nuclear, not with intermittent, unreliable re renewables. James Lovelock, a hero of mine, and the author of The Gaia Hypothesis, you know, he's a very big um, supporter of nuclear. Um, so I believe nuclear must be a part of our solution. And uh, I think over time, I'm hoping that you'll find that other people like myself will realise that nuclear energy um, is really one of the best ways to protect biodiversity and provide carbon-free uh, electricity and energy. So thank you.